we first need to uh, lay out a framework to do the welfare analysis in. So something we could do is that we could just take any of the models that we've introduced in this course. We could take a basic model or two market model or dynamic model, and then, uh, you know, which, has, uh, which is fully specified with a full structure. And then within that model, we could, uh, you know, set up a uh, compute social welfare, maximize social welfare, and find, you know, like the, the tightness that maximizes um, social welfare and therefore the unemployment rate that maximizes social welfare. Uh, so this would be like a, a standard structural uh, approach. But as we've discussed, um, this is problematic because um, you know, the world may not be exactly like any of the different models that we've introduced. Um, and the formula for the efficient unemployment rate would involve a number of parameters coming from the model, and some of them may be harder to calibrate. Um, so, you know, we want to take a more of a, a sufficient statistic approach here. So, what we want to do is specify kind of a general framework for the welfare analysis, and we want the framework to be as general as possible, but of course, with just enough structures that we can have a meaningful um, welfare analysis, but nothing more. Um, and then within that general framework, we're going to determine, we're going to get a formula for the efficient unemployment rate uh, that we can apply to the to US data. But then what we can do is, of course, because the models that we've studied in the in this course, they fall under this the umbrella of that general framework. We can then apply the formula that we derive here to the specific models and to you know, retransform that formula into a structural equation specific to the model that you're interested in. So later on in the course, we're going to study, uh, for instance, optimal monetary policy in a specific model. We'll use the dynamic model to do that because to study monet of a monetary policy, we need interest rates, so we need uh, a dynamic model. Um, and in that model, we can use the formula that we'll derive today and apply to that model to figure out in that model, like what is the efficient tightness and efficient unemployment rate and so on. Um, but here we want to uh, take a sufficient statistic approach. So we want to have a framework that's as general as possible. So the first step, uh, you know, the first ingredient in this framework is that there is unemployment. Um, and so in fact, what we are going to assume is that uh, there is a share which we call U um, of the labor force that is unemployed. Okay, um, so that's pretty uh, that's pretty easy. Now um, a question. Now um, you know, in general, um, these unemployed they may contribute. Uh, to social welfare, uh, workers may, uh, so in general, they contribute to social welfare. And so how do unemployed workers contribute to welfare? Well, um, what we have in mind you know, in matching model, very often people assume that the, um, the, the flow value of unemployment is actually, I mean, sometimes people calibrate it to be almost as high as the flow value um, of work, which means that unemployed workers are almost as productive as employed workers. Of course, it sounds a bit silly. Uh, and, you know, I think these calibrations, they are a bit silly. Like in, in the real world, there's no evidence that unemployed workers are anywhere as um, productive or derive anywhere as much welfare as uh, employed worker. Um, but nevertheless, you know, that's something that uh, some people uh, do. And the reason why they think that that's okay is because they think that uh, unemployed worker, for instance, they may, uh, they may engage in home production. So of course, that's a bit strange to make that assumption because the idea of uh, unemployed workers in our model is that they're unemployed, but they're job seekers. They are looking for jobs. They spend time searching for a job, and that's why you know they enter into the matching function, and that's why they're able to uh, find vacancies and find jobs. So they are supposed to 
uh, spend time doing that uh, and they might not have much time to do anything else. But in any case, um, through home production, uh, unemployed workers could, you know, they don't work in a firm, so they are maybe not as productive as if they were employed, but through home production, they can produce some stuff um, which would contribute to social welfare. Um, you know, in a sense, an employed worker, because they have, you know, uh, they have uh, leisure time, they may engage in recreational activities, and that may contribute to welfare, you know, through their well-being from doing uh, recreational activities. Uh, so, you know, that's all this is, uh, all this is a possibility. However, if you look at the data, what you see is that um, unemployed workers are quite miserable. Um, and in fact, you know, it looks very much like overall, so it's true that they, they could do a you know, production, they have more time for recreation, um, but, you know, but they don't have access to the tools of production as if they were employed. And of course, plus being unemployed has very uh, bad consequences on, um, you know, mental health, um, because of course, a lot of people derive value and self-worth from their employment. A lot of people's identity is linked to their employment. And when they don't have employment, because they're unemployed uh, and when they lose their job, you know, their identity uh, is, you know, uh, threatened and their sense of self-worth is damaged. And so people feel usually very bad when they're unemployed. So that all in all, it does look like people who are uh, unemployed have no contribution to social welfare just because, um, you know, of the, 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 just the sheer psychological cost of being unemployed. Um, that's something, you know, uh, there's a lot of evidence of that. Uh, here is a short uh, kind of discussion of these topics and just showing you that this idea that unemployed workers, you know, do not contribute to social welfare. So in the sense that unemployment, um, you know, is, is just like pure, um, you know, it's really pure slack. It, it's just something that, you know, these workers could be used and they could be productive, but they are not. And so it really, it, it's a, you know, it's a waste from uh, the aggregate um, economy's perspective. So here's a little discussion that we have uh, in a recent paper with um, Emmanuel Saez. So this, we take that from there. Uh, and we link back to some older discussion of the cost of unemployment. Uh, Right, so here what we say is that, uh, so unemployed worker, you know, they might produce stuff at home, so you may have uh, home production, uh, and this would be included in aggregate production, contribute to welfare, um, but in practice, you know, it doesn't seem to be the case. And in fact, so Joanne Robinson, she had a long discussion of the cost of unemployment. She was thinking about full employment, which is in a way like what is the efficient level of unemployment. Um, and so she had a, a long discussion of, what the cost of unemployment might be. And here's what she said. She said the most important aspect of unemployment is its wastefulness. So it is wasteful from an aggregate perspective. The existence of unused productive resources. So this, all these unemployed workers, they could be employed and produce stuff that's valued by society, but they are not. Side by side with unsatisfied human needs. So the fact that if you have more production, that brings you utility. That is the intolerable um, condition. Um, so this is, you know, this is just uh, a quote, um, but you can measure more formally the value of unemployment. Um, and so, in fact, in some another paper, you know, that's something that we do. And so we uh, we try to measure the fraction of non-work time uh, devoted to home production. So if we say, okay, unemployed workers, they spend some of their time searching for jobs, but part of the time they may do home production. Uh, and for that, we use a very nice study by Borg Schultz and Martorell, who have access to um, administrative data from the military. And, uh, and they look at people who have the choice between re-enlisting and leaving the military. And the key thing here in their, you know, in their setup, it's a natural experiment because uh, if people leave the military, they will go back to their local, you know, to their region where they are from, and different regions have different unemployment rates. And so you can see how, how 
people who have to go back to labor markets with different unemployment rate respond and make a decision. And of course, if you see that when unemployment is a bit higher, people tend to stay in the military. And when unemployment is a bit lower, people tend to leave the military. It's going to give you a sense of how costly unemployment is. Furthermore, there's an extra source of variation because of people who are to service members who have to choose between staying and leaving. They are also offered different bonuses and stuff. So you have a lot of ways to identify the value uh, and cost of unemployment. Uh, and so what, if, what you, know, you can figure out is that the value of home production relative to market production is actually very close to zero. Uh, so if you think that you could have some home production, actually, in practice, actually, there is, uh, there is nothing at all. Uh, and so in, in the paper, we assume that uh, there is no home production at all, so that unemployed workers do not contribute to social welfare. And so that's what, uh, that's what we're going to assume here in the course. Um, so, so we assume that uh, job seekers do not contribute to welfare, all right? And so, uh, of course, if you want to develop a more general uh, framework, you could have a statistic that measures the amount of home production that a household uh, do and so you could me you could measure the productivity of an employed worker relative to employed worker. You would have a statistic that measures that here. What we've just said that it, you know in that other paper that's actually what we measure. We find that statistic could be as low as 0 0.03, so almost zero. Here to simplify the analysis, we set it to zero. But you could have a sufficient statistic which is the value of a production relative to production, and you could and in fact that's something that we've done. You could have a more general formula that involves that statistic. Uh, but for now, let's skip. Okay, so uh, that's uh, so we have a share U of unemployed uh, worker in the model. Second key ingredient is that there is a beverage curve that's going to tell us for a given number uh, of unemployed, it's going to spit out the number of, of vacancies in the economy. That's why this framework for welfare analysis, I call it a, a Beveridgean framework. A beverage curve, which we denote by V of U, uh, determines vacancies. Okay, uh, so let me. Right, so we have U unemployed worker. Furthermore, this number of unemployed workers through the beverage curve is going to determine the number of vacancies. Okay, and here, so you know, in same thing, this beverage. So we assume a beverage curve, and in fact, that beverage curve is a one piece of structure that's required in our Beveridgean framework. There is nothing else that's required, and in particular, we don't need to explain where the beverage curve comes from. Just assuming there is a beverage curve will be enough for the analysis. So we don't need to say, you know, whether there's a matching function, whether you have balance flows, whether it's another setup that gives a beverage curve, like a model of mismatch or a model of stock flow matching, anything like that. That's just not required. So it's just a beverage curve. And in general, you could just specify a beverage curve. You know, what would matter is the elasticity of your beverage curve. And, um, you know, and you could go into data and measure that elasticity, and that would be a key sufficient statistic. Here, to simplify, we're going to take actually the elasticity of the beverage curve to be one. That is, we're going to assume that the beverage curve is a, an hyperbola. So, you know, we're, here we're being a bit more specific. That's what's required for the analysis, just to simplify things. Um, and it's always possible to be more general, uh, more general later. So why do we assume that the beverage curve is an hyperbola? Well, it's because in the data, if you look at US data, so beverage curve is very, very close to an hyperbola. And in fact, so here is a graph. Uh, so the source of this graph is uh, I, it's uh, taken out of um, a paper that I have with uh, Emmanuel. Uh, so papers that I, you know, I just mentioned above. So this is taken out of uh, Michel and size. 2021, in which we um, compute the beverage and unemployment gap. And in that beverage and unemployment gap paper, we estimate uh, the slope or the elasticity of the beverage curve in different periods. We also estimate where the breaks of the beverage curves are. And so this is um, 
a beverage curve between so this is a US beverage curve between 1999 and 2009 um, the so 1999 is here 2009 is here so this is uh, the beginning of the great recession okay uh, and so these break dates, 1999-2009, they are estimated by an algorithm. Notice that we have log here, log here. So the slope, uh, the slope of the beverage curve here is actually an elasticity uh, because we're in log log. And so what you can see here in log log is that um, the beverage curve over this decade is almost perfectly linear. And so you can see you start in 1989, then you have a big increase in, in unemployment. And so here, in fact, you have what happens because of the dot-com uh, crash. So big increase in unemployment, then the economy recover all the way um, to uh, here. And then, of course, you have the beginning of the Great Recession. So then you have a big increase. Uh, then you have another big increase in unemployment all the way to 2009. But you can see that it's almost a perfect line, this beverage curve during that decade, and the slope is minus one. Uh, so it means that it means that uh, d log v d log u is equal to minus one. And so that means that basically v it's just uh, you know you have an hyperbola, so v is just some parameter. Uh, as we can call V0 divided by U. Okay. Uh, so we have actually an hyperbola. So here I show you just a decade, I show you the best picture. Um, but you can look at the elasticity of the beverage curve if you go back to this paper. Uh, you can look at the elasticity of the beverage curve for the entire period from the 50s to today. And the elasticity varies a little bit, but it's within a fairly narrow bend around one. So, you know, maybe the lowest value is around 0 0.8, 0 0.85, and the highest value is like 0 0.10, 0 0.15. I, you know, I forgot right now, but it's all quite a narrow bend. So here we're going to simplify and we're going to assume that uh, we're going to assume that the beverage curve is just, uh, is just an hyperbola. Which will, uh, you know, which will simplify things a lot. And this, uh, So, uh, so the unemployment rate is going to determine the vacancy rate through the beverage curve. Beverage curve here is an hyperbola. And as I was saying, if you want something more general, you can just assume that the elasticity is not one, but epsilon and reduce the analysis. So V is just V0 divided by U. Well, the last question is how much labor is actually needed to take care of these vacancies? So we said you have a share U of unemployed workers. These guys don't contribute to welfare. Once you have unemployment, that determines number of vacancies through so the beverage curve, which is a key structural assumption here. How much um, labor is actually required to take care of these uh, vacancies? And what we'd assume here is that... Um, we we'll assume that each vacancy uh, requires one recruiter. Okay, and of course, uh, that recruiter, this is somebody who uh, cannot, you know, by lack of time, because he's busy recruiting, participate in production. Or kind of kind of generate any welfare. So if we assume that each vacancy requires a, a producer, then, um, and if we denote by V the vacancy rate, then it means that there is a share V of the labor force. that's engaged in recruiting instead of producing. Okay, and that's going to be, um, that's going to be the third key assumption. So you have share U of unemployed workers that are uh, you know, engaged in job seeking and they are not participating in welfare. Share V of 
the labor force that's engaged in recruiting do not participate in welfare, and these two things are related through a beverage curve. Now, of course, in general, you could allow the you could assume that the, each vacancy requires a, a number of recruiters that's different than than um, one. Um, and that's something uh, you know that we've done, and you can derive more general formulas. But it turns out that in practice, in the US, the number of, the, of recruiters required for each vacancy is very close to one. And so here, to simplify the analysis, we'll just assume it's one. Here is a little uh, blurb uh, that comes again from the same uh, from the same papers that we've mentioned. Uh, this comes out of Michel and Saez 2022, where we justify the assumption of one recruiter um, per vacancy. Um, so the bottom line is that the you know, number of recruiters, number of vacancies are um, uh, the same in our uh, simple framework. Uh, so, of course, in, practice, in, in theory, you could have more than one recruiter, less than one recruiter per vacancy. But in practice, in the US, it takes about one full-time worker to service a vacancy. Uh, and so the way you can see it is that you can go back to the National Employer Survey uh, conducted in 1997. Um, and th in there, what you see is that servicing a vacancy requires about 0 0.92 workers, so close to one. Uh, and so here, that's what we're going to use. And in fact, there is a, a different paper uh, that looks uh, you know, that, that looks at the cost of recruiting and that also gets uh, to something that's very close to, uh, to, that, num to that number. Um, so overall, uh, here is what our beverage and framework assume. Uh, so first thing is that we'll have a share one minus u plus v of the labor force that's going to be engaged in production. So the huge unemployed workers are not engaged in any production um, because they are looking for job. And the V, uh, v is the number of recruiters, so they are not engaged in production. We'll assume that social welfare uh, is determined by production. So if we want to maximize social welfare, what you want to do is, uh, so basically maximizing welfare is equivalent to maximizing one minus u plus v. And therefore it's equivalent to minimizing u plus v. Uh, so here we're in a model, it's a very simple model where, we, where what you want to do is you're a government, you just want to minimize the sum of unemployment plus vacancies because neither unemployment nor vacancies are actually productive and contributing to welfare. And so maximizing welfare requires uh, that, but of course, there is one key piece of structure here. You know, then you could say, well, minimizing U plus V is very simple. You just set unemployment to zero, vacancies to zero, you're set. But of course, you can't. And that's a key piece of structure we assume because there is a beverage curve. The key thing is that uh, U, V are related by uh, a beverage curve, which is an hyperbola. Uh, and so that beverage curve is basic, is just uh, V is V0 divided by U. And that's taken, you know, as uh, given by the government. And you know, it's we assume that it's stable over time. It's just so you have this key relationship. That's a key piece of structure we assume is that. And so because of that, if you set u to zero, v will go to infinity. So that's not good in terms of minimizing the sum of u plus v. If you set v to zero, u has to be infinite. That's not good in terms of minimizing u plus v. So we can see that there'll be a trade-off between unemployment and vacancy governed by the beverage curve. That's what we're going to solve now. 